At the highest level of competition, winning a race is hard. But every once in a while, a car comes along that just demolishes its rivals like it's child's play. Hey guys, I'm Stipe, and this is my list of the top seven most dominating race cars ever. BMW E30 M3. Starting strong with a car that's said to have been winning a race every single day during the height of its domination. Every day I'm winning. It's the first ever M3, and besides the World Touring Car Championship crown, it also has two European ones, two Germans, two British, four Italian, six various ones from Australia, and seven Japanese JTC2 class championships under its belt. Well, okay, those JTC2 victories were mostly because every team switched to the M3 as soon as possible. But the 24-hour endurance races are a different story, and still, the E30 managed to win five times at Nürburgring and four times at Spa. Hell, it even won a rally in Corsica. So how? How can it be so good? The simple answer is the German engineering. A more serious one is the M3 was so finely tuned and put together that it didn't matter that Ford had more power or Audi had more grip. To win, you need to strike a perfect balance of weight, power, handling, and I can't stress this enough, reliability. What's the point of having the fastest car if that speed fades away or it completely breaks after two laps? Well, shit. As a result of all this, the M3 gave the drivers confidence the other cars just couldn't. The confidence to push harder, break later, put down consistent laps, and by the time the race ends, the chances are you'll be at number one. Volkswagen Polo WRC. What would you say is the best rally car ever made? Audi Quattro, Lancia Stratos, Lancer Evolution, the Impreza? Well, statistically, it's this, Volkswagen Polo. As soon as it debuted, it started winning. Rally after rally, year after year. Out of 52 races that it entered, Polo won 43. Its drivers climbed the podium 87 times. And as with most rally cars, it didn't stick around for long. But in those four years that it did, Polo won both drivers and constructors crowns each year. When you put all that into the success calculator, it comes out as 82.7%, enough to make it the most dominating rally car ever made but there's a caveat to that. Rallying is so chaotic and unpredictable that to win, often a more important factor is who is driving rather than what. And so behind the wheel of the all-conquering Volkswagen sat a Frenchman called Sebastian Auger, who at the time was like the LeBron James of rallying. Unless he had bad luck, you could bet your entire Pokemon card collection that Augie would win. All in. Meanwhile, his teammate who drove the same car on the same tracks struggled to be second. So maybe it wasn't the car after all. And to further prove that, look at what happened when Volkswagen pulled out of the sport because of the whole Dieselgate scandal. Oje moved to Ford, where he won two titles, and then Toyota, where he won two more. But stats are stats, and they say Polo is the greatest rally car ever. Yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> Red Bull RB19. At the polar opposite end of rallying is Formula One. The only time it ever gets chaotic is if there's some mosh pit kind of situation in the first corner. The rest is just precise, tactical, and down to a millisecond racing. So yeah, having the fastest car is absolutely necessary to win. Oh, what's that, Hamilton? Having trouble scoring points lately? Meanwhile, his arch rival from Red Bull could start from 15th place and still finish on the podium. That did happen, by the way. The reason is simple. The so-called RB19 that Max was driving was as close to unbeatable as you can get. Out of 22 races on the calendar, this car won 21. That's a 95% success rate, which is more than what I get when I'm just aiming at the toilet bowl. So what's the secret ingredient? Mmm, suspension, probably. Without going into too much details, the suspension geometry allowed the car to be lower to the ground without suffering from the dreaded porpoising effect. That improves downforce, DRS effectiveness, and also saves the tires, somehow. Look, I'm no expert, I'm just repeating what others are saying. The RB19 was also lighter than the predecessor, and its Honda engine was now engineered to perfection. Zero mechanical failures for an entire season is almost unheard of. 
So what happened in that one race when Red Bull didn't win? Well, Singapore is a bumpier track, so the ride height had to be raised, and that was enough to throw the whole car off balance. Well, shit. Ferrari's first victory since Austria last year, Red Bull's perfect season ends at Grand Prix 15. Bugatti Type 35. Some 100 years ago, racing was eh, just a bunch of dudes showing up with their cars to see who's the fastest. There were barely any rules or regulations or even classes like we have today. Take this Bugatti Type 35, for example. This same car competed in the World Grand Prix in endurance racing, rallying, and who knows what else. Stranger still, it was winning it all, too. Yeah, bitch! Some records from that time were lost, but Bugatti claims that the Type 35 won over 2,000 races between 1924 and 1930. And I believe that. The T35 may look archaic now, but back then, this racing Bugatti was some next level shit. It was probably the first car ever that tried to be as light as possible. Like, instead of having a massive 7 liter straight six as the Mercedes SSK, Bugatti chose to have a supercharged 2.3 liter and still hit the same top speed. Lots of body parts were made from aluminum, and the same is true for those massive wheels. Hey, less unsprung weight makes the car handle even when the tires are as thin as the steering wheel. But just because this Bugatti was the fastest car around, it don't mean that winning was easy. Nuh-uh. Just look at the damn thing! It's like sitting in a metal coffin that you just happen to share with this searing hot engine. That's not driving, it's more like operating a machine in a way that won't get you killed. If you ask me, even finishing 2,000 races would be a success, let alone winning them. Dodge Charger Daytona Back in the olden days, the prize for winning at NASCAR wasn't just some trophy and the bragging rights, but because you could only use the production cars, a huge bump in their sales too. If you ever wonder where the whole win on Sunday, sell on Monday comes from, it's this. Cobra, when we win, you win. For Dodge, this endeavor wasn't going so well. Despite having a better engine, their Charger was struggling against the Ford Torino, and as it turns out, it was because of the terrible aerodynamics. So, let's get an actual rocket scientist from the Chrysler Missile Division to help us out. That dude? Surely know what to do. His idea? Put on a nose cone, level out the back window, and lastly, a wing higher than Snoop Dogg. They called it the Charger Daytona, and you, well, your granddad, could uh, excuse me, could actually go out and buy one. It was, as per rules, a street legal production car. On the tracks, expectedly, Daytona demolished its competition. It was the first car to hit 200 miles per hour in a race, while the best that Ford could do was 190. That makes for quite a gap after 500 miles. So Ford did the only thing they could. They complained. That's a race car, not a real production car. That's cheating, and they're ruining the sport. Oh, I'm sorry, did I break your concentration? So NASCAR implemented a rule. If you're gonna use these winged warriors, as they were called, you can't have an engine larger than 350 cubic inches. And that was the end of that. Oh, also the Charger Daytona sold terribly. Can't imagine why. Porsche 956. We can't talk about motorsport without mentioning Porsche. And since we're talking about the most dominating models, the choice is super obvious, the 956. Sure, the 911 is always there to ruin everyone's day, but against this thing, there wasn't much of a point of even trying. Between 1982 and 1987, nothing, not a damn thing won the Le Mans except for this car. The 83 was particularly devastating. Out of the top 10 spots, nine were Porsche 956s. Again, nobody's perfect, but damn, how close can you get? And getting there isn't a matter of luck either, but innovating where others just didn't know how. The first ever dual clutch gearbox, or as Porsche calls it, the double clump of pluck of fucking, it was found in this car. The first ever aluminum monocoque, again, this 956. First Porsche with ground effects, you guessed it, the 956. And that was probably the main reason why it did so well. Looking at its predecessor, the shape is kind of similar, and yet this new one generates three times as much downforce. Or in other words, enough to drive it in Australia. A fact that Porsche so creatively illustrated in their museum in Stuttgart. Also, the 956 held the longest lasting lap record around the Nürburgring, 35 years. 
F1 cars came and went, 2,000 horsepower electric monsters too, and even the most modern hypercars. But until 2018, nothing was quick enough. So what finally managed to beat it? It's grand grand grandchild, the 919 Evo. Now, before I reveal the most dominating race car ever, here's some honorable mentions. Let's see if you can guess them. And at number one, here we go. Godzilla, baby. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> the Nissan Skyline GTR R32 was. From 1990 to 93, this car won every race in the Japanese Touring Car Championship. Every single one. And don't be thinking JTCC was just for the Japanese cars. No, 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 no. Group A cars from all over the world were allowed to compete, but after Skyline GTR entered the ring, there wasn't much of a reason to even try. As was evident by the grid in 1993. Hey, do you want to win or not? Then this is what you'll drive. But the domination wasn't confined just to the land of the rising sun. The annual Bathurst 1000 saw similar results. That's usually an Australian V8 kind of a cage fight between Holden and Ford. But when Nissan showed up... Watch the Nissan now. This is the moment for Jimmy Richards. Pulls to the inside and Klaus moves over. They are side by side. Jim actually gives him the goodbye. For the next year, the race organizers tried to slow it down by having it carry the additional 309 pounds of weight, but the result was still the same. It was then that the Aussie journalist gave the R32 its famous nickname, Godzilla, the monster from Japan that brings destruction. Monster kill. Now, people often accredit this success to the RB26 DETT engine, which in road specs develops 280 horsepower, while for racing goes up to six or even 800. And while that was a big reason, a bigger one was its Atessa four-wheel drive system. Nissan actually bought the Porsche 959, which at the time was the most advanced hypercar in the world, took it apart to see how its four-wheel drive works and thought, hey, we can do better than that. And they did, to the point that in 94, the whole Group A category of racing where the Skyline competed was scrapped. It killed the entire category of sport. That's the kind of monster this Godzilla was. And that's the end of the video. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Cut!